Welcome everybody to our Fill Your Pantry Jams and Jellies webinar by the University of Illinois Extension. Since it is about 1 p.m. here, we are going to get going. Before we start, we do want to make sure that your microphone is muted to prevent any type of background sounds, as well as to make sure your camera is turned off. We have been trying to go through and turn them off as we see them come on, but just double check to make sure that's turned off. That helps with our bandwidth, so it's really strong throughout the day. So thank you for helping us out with that. All righty. So moving on. So today is our fifth of our eight webinars in the Fill Your Pantry series, following the previous canning, freezing, fermenting, and drying webinars. All of our webinars are being recorded, and we are working with our campus digital team to get them onto our website as soon as we can. Um, the website, and I'll make sure to put this in the chat box here in a few minutes, is go.illinois.edu backslash nutrition well. And like I said, once I hand over the presentation, I'll make sure to put that into the chat box, that link, as well as um, I'll just mention it at the end as well. Um, speaking of the chat box, please feel free to use it today to ask any questions. That's specifically what we want to be using that chat box for, is for those questions. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can as we go today. Um, your presenter will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but please keep in mind that she may be addressing them as we go. So I know the last couple slides she goes through are a lot of our frequently asked questions regarding jams and jellies. And again, that's typically near the end of her, end of her presentation. Um, since we are limited to an hour, if we do not address every single question that you put into the chat box, we are gonna be sending you every single one of those questions and answers that are coming into that chat box, as well as recipes and other helpful jams and jellies handouts for today. Alrighty, so moving on here, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Lisa Peterson, and I'm going to be your moderator today. I am a nutrition and wellness educator with University of Illinois Extension. I work in Christian, Jersey, McCoupin, and Montgomery counties and West Central Illinois. Um, another person who's on this call with us who I don't have a picture of, but that is the University of Illinois nutrition and wellness educator, Susan Glassman. You may see her pop up in our chat box. She's going to help address questions as we go through today, as well as some as the technical side of our webinar. So moving right in, our presenter today is Mary Liz Wright. She is another nutrition and wellness educator, and she serves Clark Crawford and Edgar counties on the east side of the state. Um, Mary Liz has over 20 years of experience in extension. And from there, I'm going to pass that ladle on over to Mary Liz. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I'm happy to be here today. And um, we are here coming to you as part of the University of Illinois Extension. And Extension is the flagship outreach effort of the University of Illinois. Uh, we offer research-based educational programs to residents of Illinois in all 102 counties and far beyond. And you'll notice that when you registered, we ask that you give us your zip code. And we just find it interesting how far out we're reaching in and into uh, what particular counties in Illinois and then uh, other states as well. So as Lisa said, we are absolutely thrilled that you have joined us today. We're going to be talking about jams and jellies. Also, as she said, this is fifth in a series of eight. And uh, many of the questions that you might have will be addressed as we go through the program. So, so sit back. Don't feel like you have to take notes of everything I say. We're going to be sending you some fairly comprehensive handouts. And uh, feel free to type those questions in the chat box. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Well, the different types of sweet bread spreads, it's not all jams and jellies, but we are going to concentrate on them specifically when we're talking about the step-by-step -step process. And as always in all of our presentations, we are going to talk quite a bit about food safety because our goal is to make a good product that people can enjoy and enjoy it safely. We'll also be answering those common questions. And we chose jam and jelly as, as one of our topics because really jams and jellies are a wonderful first food preservation project. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. And let's go through the process. 
So the first thing we want to address is food spoilage. Um, isn't that an attractive bunch of grapes there? So in the world of nature, it is nature's way to begin the enzymatic process or the decay process or deterioration, whatever you want to call it, upon harvest. So as soon as you harvest that fruit or vegetable, nature is sending those enzymes to that, that uh, fruit or, or vegetable to begin decay. And the reason it does that and it has those chemical changes is because the whole purpose of the fruit or vegetable is to provide food for the seed that will sprout and grow into the next generation. So in uh, the food preservation project, we're going to be talking about enzymes, chemical changes, but also microorganisms. And you see some mold growing on those grapes and that's a microorganism that, that we address in the, in the jams and jelly specifically uh, because those are things that can invade and uh, cause spoilage to our, our end product or even to the, the product um, prior to. So one uh, thing that we want to pay attention to is when we are preserving food, be it jam and jelly or, or another type of, of preservation, you want to choose the fruit or vegetable at its peak of ripeness and also its best quality. There are, there are some folks who say, you know, I wait and I use all the damaged tomatoes, for example, uh, to can. And that might sound like you're being very frugal, but in reality, that can cause problems in the end. So only use uh, fruit as near perfect as you can get it and also begin that preservation process as soon as possible. Don't let things sit around before you turn them into jam or jelly or salsa or what have you. So how do we preserve food? We can do that by three different ways. And again, we're wanting to slow down or stop the enzymatic, the ripening, the degradation process that is natural to that fruit or vegetable. And how do we do that? Well, in canning, we do it with temperature and then also pressure. So the temperature can inactivate the enzymes and kill the microorganisms that can eventually cause foodborne illness. Freezing and drying both uh, don't kill or in inactivate enzymes, but they do slow down the activity. Freezing and drying also prevent microorganisms from growing by reducing temperature and or removing moisture. And so when we're thinking about food preservation, what I always like to share with people is that, um, you know, food preservation sounds scary to some folks and everyone has that story about great aunt Mildred whose pressure canner blew up in the kitchen and she had peaches all over her ceiling but actually it's not that scary food preservation is science but it's not rocket science and we will tell you several times throughout this presentation to follow directions exactly and by doing so you will end up with a safe and delicious product. Methods of canning, since we're going to be talking about jams and jellies today and they are a canned product, there are uh, two different kinds of canning processes. Now the one we're gonna be talking about today is the water bath canning. And what that does is it uses boiling water to raise the temperature and kill most of the microorganisms, um, reducing the microorganisms to a safe level inside that jar of acid food. So foods that begin um, with a, an acid um, in composition, like fruits, jams, jellies, we also can use the boiling water bath method for things we have acidified by adding an acid, so like our tomato products or, or pickles, which we'll discuss next week. But anyway, jams and jellies, boiling water bath canning. Pressure canning is reserved for low acid foods. Meats, vegetables, or those combination of foods, soups, that sort of thing. The reason we have to use pressure canning for um, the low acid foods is because of a pathogen known as Clostridium botulinum. 
Well, now this is a, a foodborne bacteria. It's, it's all around us in the world and it really doesn't pose a, a risk to us until we put it in an environment without oxygen, which is the interior of a canned food. And so uh, under those conditions, this bacteria can produce a toxin that is deadly and can cause some permanent damage um, th to your nervous system. So uh, it is something that we pay very close attention to. And in our processing of foods, that's another reason we want to adhere to directions exactly. At some point, if this were an in-person um, workshop, one of you might pose the question, but uh, we don't hear about botulism anymore. We thought that was an old fashioned thing. And uh, that's incorrect because we have botulism cases nearly every year throughout the world. For example, from 1999 to 2008, there were 116 botulism outbreaks in the United States. So we definitely need to pay attention when we're processing those low acid foods and make sure that if you're using a pressure canner that has a dial gauge, you would want to get that tested every year to make sure it is accurate. And you can call your local extension office to find out how you can get that done. So I said we were going to be talking about food safety, kitchen safety, everything we do. We want to make sure we're observing the proper hygiene practices. So of course, we're going to wash our hands. Something that people often uh, find surprising is that in addition to washing the hands before we begin uh, the canning process in our kitchen, we also recommend washing your hands before you go to the garden. So think for a minute. If there are any germs on your hands and you go to the garden and you pick that produce, you have transferred the germs on your hands onto the produce. So we would like to eliminate that risk by washing our hands before we go to the garden. And then again, when we come into the kitchen, always avoid handling food if you don't feel well. And if you have long hair, pull your hair back, wear a hat, wear a hairnet. Uh, we also wanna make sure all the surfaces in our kitchen are clean as well as all of our utensils. Just making sure everything is cleaned with hot soapy water is good enough. You might want to take a, another step and sanitize, and you can do that by making a bleach water solution. It's just um, a teaspoon of bleach per quart of water. Spray it on and let it dry. Oh, excuse me. So what type of sweet spreads are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to concentrate, as I said, on jams and jellies, but there are other types of sweet spreads. And just to give you a quick definition, preserves, similar to jams, but in preserves, the um, fruit is left whole. So in jams, everything is chopped up and then put into a sugar syrup solution and processed. Jellies, we're only dealing with the juice. Preserves is the whole fruit in a slightly gelled syrup. Conserves are a mixture. So often they'll have nuts or coconut and they have a similar uh, consistency to jam. So it's spreadable, doesn't flow too much when you, when you um, pour it out. Marmalades, so uh, Paddington Bear's favorite substance are, are made with uh, usually citrus and uh, always part of the peel is included. And uh, they're beautiful in that um, you can see the bits of fruit floating around in kind of a clear gel. Uh, butters, uh, on the other hand, are the fruit pulp mixed with sugar and spice and cooked to a consistency uh, to where the um, fruit butter will mound up on the spoon. And not included on this list, but also something that I learned as a young bride, my uh, mother-in-law gave me a recipe for pear honey. And I thought, well, this is interesting. What do I do, mix up pears and honey? put it in a jar. No, the, the term honey is, is interchangeable with syrup. And uh, what it is, is the fruit juice or pulp cooked into a consistency that's not as thick as a fruit butter. It's actually quite delicious. And uh, later on, we're going to be talking about 
what happens if where we'll address some of our common questions and one very common question is what do I do if my if my jam doesn't sit well and you know there there are many many things you can do but but one thing that uh, I have told people before is well just call it a honey if you're if your uh, strawberry jam doesn't set, oh, well, then you've made strawberry honey. And you can use it as uh, a topping for biscuits or, or ice cream. There's, you know, any number of things you can do. But anyway, what do we do first when we are wanting to make a jam or jelly? Well, we must find a tested recipe. And by that, we mean that it needs to come from a reliable source. And that would be either the National Center for Home Food Preservation, the USDA canning guide, any source from an extension from any state, uh, so a cooperative extension in any state in the United States. And you can also use the, the commercial canning company uh, recipes, not that we're um, address endorsing anyone, but Ball or Kerr or Mrs. Wages, all of those are fine. What we don't want you to do is use great grandma's recipe developed before 1985. And I'm sure that that recipe was absolutely delicious. However, the directions for processing will be different than the ones that we will be using today. So go ahead and make grandma's strawberry rhubarb preserves or what have you, and then just keep it in the refrigerator and use it from there. Uh, there are other uh, things that we want to uh, pay attention to and avoid uh, from a food safety standpoint, and that is uh, the open kettle method. And by open kettle, what we mean is, and I can remember doing this as, as a young child, and we would have the hot uh, mixture, the hot fruit, sugar, syrup um, mixture, and we would put it in a hot jar, put a hot lid on it, and then quite often we would turn it upside down. And then when we would turn it right side up, it would seal and we thought we were good to go. Science has shown us in the last several years that it is best to process everything in a boiling water bath. And so we no longer endorse the open kettle method. So, Next thing after finding a good recipe is we want to gather our ingredients. And so juice, if we're going to be making jelly or fruit for jam. As I said, uh, jam or jelly are our, our great first step in the food preservation uh, learning curve because you only have three ingredients. And if you're not using commercial pectin, you'll only have two ingredients. It doesn't really get much easier than that. And when we're gathering our fruit, and you can see by this picture that a few of those berries are a little underripe. And that's good because those berries will have more natural pectin. And uh, we, we would want to do that um, to make sure that our end product is uh, of a sufficient gel. Now, the other end of that is we don't want to have too many green or underripe fruits in our mixture um, because that can add too much starch to the mix and we can end up with a, a cloudy product. So, so just about one fourth to one third slightly underripe. The next thing we want to do is gather our equipment and you know when you begin to can it is somewhat of, of an investment. You do need to buy those those commercial canning jars. Please don't use old jelly jars, pickle jars, olive jars. Uh, you know, we, we did years and years ago in the old mayonnaise jars, uh, for example. And what we have learned and, and what, uh, just keep in mind, you're going to a lot of trouble and, and some expense to do this. If you use a jar that is not a commercial grade canning jar, you run the risk of that jar exploding in your canner. So not only is that a danger, uh, you could cut yourself on the shards of glass, but also you've just wasted a whole, a whole jar or two of product after you've gone to all that work. So buy the commercial canning jars. They last forever as long as there's no nicks or cracks in them and, and check it out on that rim and make sure there's no nicks. 
uh, you can buy them at garage sales really cheaply. Uh, get the jars, lids, rings. We uh, recommend you use a, a national brand uh, for this as well. You want high quality lids and rings. We're only going to use those lids one time. You can reuse the rings, but the lids can only be used one time. Jar lifter is really uh, a convenience and also a safety factor. And so you um, need that to be able to pull those jars out of the very hot water. And a funnel allows you to fill the jars uh, much more accurately and uh, evenly. A long handled spoon and then a pot or pan to both oh, yeah. boil the jam or jelly in and then also a larger stew pot to uh, use as your water bath canner. So. As far as size of jars, use what the recipe suggests. <laughs> if you use a different size of jar, well, the processing time is going to be off, and then you will very likely end up with a product that is not of the same consistency as the others. So it'll either be too stiff or, or too loose. All right, so we mentioned a little bit about these unsafe methods. We see these occasionally. Um, I've even read newspaper articles. Uh, unfortunately, there's, an, uh, there's a lot of information on the internet that is not accurate. You cannot process canned goods in your dishwasher or your microwave oven or your oven. Uh, the other thing is we don't use one piece lids. There are some modern one piece lids on the market right now and uh, we don't recommend those either. Uh, paraffin wax. Grandma used to seal that jam and jelly with paraffin wax and I know that you can remember as well as I do popping that off and chewing it like it was gum and it had a, a hint of flavor of the jam or jelly and we don't recommend that uh, any longer because there could be a hairline crack around the edge of that wax and molds or, or yeast could get in there and uh, you would res it would result in spoiling the food. So, so again, you've gone to all this trouble and all this time. So make sure you're using the proper equipment and methods. Okay, now we need to set up our equipment. Fill your canner, and this is a boiling water bath canner. You can buy one that is that says boiling water bath canner. You can also use a, a large soup pot. You just need to have something to use as a rack in the bottom so that those jars are not touching the bottom of the pan directly. Uh, we don't want them rocking back and forth in the boiling water. So if it has a rack, that's great. So you're going to fill it up uh, halfway with water. Heat, heat it to simmer, uh, you know, not boiling, but simmer. Add the jars to the warm water and sterilize if needed. Now we're going to uh, cover that here in just a little bit. So we don't always sterilize jars, uh, only under certain circumstances. So many of us have flat top stoves. Can we process, can we can on a flat top stove? And uh, the question is, it all depends. It depends on the uh, the manufacturer of the stove and their recommendations. But what we do want you to be aware of is that flat top stoves don't give us a continuous same level of heat. And you'll notice if you look at that stove top, the burner will be cherry red and then it will fade and then cherry red and then it will fade. And if you cannot maintain that vigorous boil for the amount of time designated in the processing time in the recipe, then you might not be satisfied with the product and it could render it unsafe. The same is true for portable burners. Uh, you, you could run out of gas, you could, you know, any number of things could happen with a portable burner. The other thing to consider with a flat top stove is a canner full of water and filled jars is very, very heavy. You run the risk of cracking the top or scratching it or, or otherwise damaging it. And again, many flat top stoves have that um, recommendation or requirement for flat topped or flat bottomed uh, vessels to cook with. And so your canner might not have that smooth flat bottom. So some things to consider. Oops. So now we're going to prepare the recipe and we're going to follow the recipe exactly. And you see in the photo here that she is pouring the commercial pectin into the chopped fruit for strawberry jam. Now, if we are making a recipe without the commercial pectin, we need to 
make sure that we are heating the jam or jelly to 218 to 220. And you need to use a candy or a deep fry thermometer to do this. And again, this is only if you're not using the commercial pectin. I will tell you, I like the flavor of the jams and jellies made without pectin. It's a little trickier to get the gel, but I find that it's worth it. And when I do in-person workshops, I always do a recipe without pectin so that people understand that, that it can be done. Uh, so we have the temperature test, but then we can also use the sheet test, it's called. And you see the two spoons here. And so you would take a cool metal spoon, dip it down into the boiling mixture, pull it up, and if you see several drops coming off the spoon, it's not yet cooked to the consistency of jelly. But if it comes down and two drops form into one, kind of like it's going to pull off that spoon in one piece, then it is uh, of the right consistency. After cooking, we need to fill the jars to the appropriate headspace. Again, following the directions, most jams or jellies have a one quarter inch headspace. And you can measure that with a ruler or there are some other uh, commercial tools you can use. Wipe the rims clean, add the, ling, the, the lid and the ring to that. And then we're going to process. So we're gonna load the jars into the canner. Um, if you have a rack, that works great. Add more boiling water. So you might wanna have a tea kettle going at the same time. So you're going to add more boiling water because you want to cover each jar with an inch or two of water. And then you need a little bit of air space, one to two inches at the top of that pot uh, for the action of the boiling not to bubble out on and make a mess on your stove. So bring the water to a rolling boil and start your timer. Again, if the power goes out or or you have a, a little dip in uh, temperature and the water temperature goes down you need to bring it back up to a boiling a rolling boil and start your timer all over again you must process for the time stated in the recipe and after we have uh, processed and and kept the jars in the boiling water bath for the required amount of time you want to turn the heat off Carefully remove that canner lid, and by carefully we mean away from your face, so point it towards the back of the stove. Then let the jar sit for five minutes. And this is just a safety factor. Uh, once they have sat for five minutes, pull them out of the boiling water bath. Don't tip the jars to get that water off. Listen for sealing and let them sit undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. So do not uh, move the canner from the heat until it cools off. That's an awful lot of very hot water uh, and you can cause uh, severe burns. Even you know, steam is, is, a, is a terrible burn as well. And when you're putting the jars on your counter, make sure there's a rack. If you don't have a rack, double up a bath towel. And particularly if you have a stone uh, countertop that is kind of cool to the touch, you certainly don't ever ever want to put a hot jar on that because it will uh, burst and you'll have a terrible mess. The next thing we need to do after they've sat for 12 to 24 hours, we're going to check the seals. If they didn't seal, they can be reprocessed. Uh, you want to label them with the food and the date and I like to write that on top of the lid. You know, some people have those stickers, but if you use the same jars over and over again, getting those stickers off is a pain. So just write it on the lid, remove the ring. And we do that for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one being that we can reuse that ring on our next batch. And then secondly, if you don't have the ring on, you can observe uh, just by looking at the side of the jar where it's in, in your storage uh, space, if there's any spoilage occurring. Um, you know, you can see uh, that the ring might cover some of some of that spoilage and so take the ring off and then store the jars in a cool dry space. Now we're going to show you a video of how to make strawberry jam.
Hey guys, I see we're having some problem with audio here. So what we'll do is Susan will quickly get the video playing and we'll see if we can get the audio to work. Sorry about that. We'll take care of it oh. here in just a second. So sorry. Here, I was just okay. watching away. No problem. <laughs> okay, right, so we'll wait for Susan to share so her screen. I will share Read my screen. Yeah, so that way everyone can hear it. And... Let's see, is everybody got it? Yeah, I can hear it or I can see it and we just can't hear it. Yeah, I, oh don't, I don't hear okay. it. Okay. Should I mute myself, you think? Hang on. Yeah, there's I'm a set click. Hold on. I've mashed. I'm going to start again because I'm going to see if this helps better with the sound. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. I'm Mary Liz Wright with the University of Illinois Extension. We are going to make strawberry jam. The first thing you want to do when you're making jams or jellies is, of course, to wash your fruit. Our recipe calls for six cups of mashed berries. It's good to have about a third underripe and two-thirds fully ripe fruit. It's important to measure your fruit accurately. If you use too much fruit, it won't gel correctly, and you'll be disappointed in your end product. We have mixed one quarter cup of sugar with the Sure Gel Commercial Pectin. We're going to add that to our fruit. The next step is optional, but if you add just a half teaspoon of butter or margarine, this will reduce the foaming of your jam. Once it has reached that full boil, and by that we mean a boil that does not stop when you stir, you need to add your pre-measured four cups of sugar. Continue to heat it until the whole mixture comes again to a full rolling boil and boil for exactly one minute. Turn your heat off. You'll want to take a metal spoon and skim off any foam that has risen to the top. Stir it up, redistributing the berries. Now you're ready to fill your hot jars. You want a quarter inch head space. I want to clean the top of my jar, making sure there's nothing between the glass rim and the gum sealing compound on the lid. Twist the ring in place just until it is finger tight. It's an excellent idea to get a hot water bath with a rack. Then lower the rack into the boiling water. The water should cover the jars by one to two inches. You don't want them to be leaning against the side of the canner, other jars. For strawberry jam, we're going to process this in the boiling water for 10 minutes. So now we're going to turn the heat off. After you remove the lid, let the jars stay in the canner for another five minutes. Keep the jar perfectly upright. Place the jars on a rack with at least one inch between each jar. If there's a little water on the top of the jar, don't worry about that. If you tilt that jar to remove the water, it could hamper the sealing process with the lid. So don't worry about the water, it's going to evaporate. Let the jars stay on the rack for 12 to 24 hours undisturbed so you can enjoy this strawberry jam all winter long with your family. A taste of summer in a jar. Okay, back, back to you, Mary Liz. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susan. You saved the day. <laughs> You're welcome. So, so that was a, a video we made uh, actually several years ago. And um, 
I enjoyed making that video. I enjoy making jams. So I hope that illustrated a, a few uh, things for you, and maybe answered some of your questions. So next, uh, frequently asked questions. When do I need to sterilize my jars? Well, and the answer to that is you need to sterilize your jars when the processing time in your recipe is less than 10 minutes. We really only consider this when making some jams and jellies. And one of the reasons that uh, the processing times are less for jam and jelly is number one, because they're high acid. But secondly, because over-processed jams and jellies can darken the end product. And we all like that, that brilliant, sparkly, bright jam or jelly. And uh, if we process it too long, it has a tendency to be dark. And so how do I sterilize my jars if that processing time is less than 10 minutes? Well, I can tell you how not to sterilize your jars. And that is by using the sanitizing uh, setting on your dishwasher. There is a difference between sanitizing and sterilizing. Sanitizing is getting something really, really clean. And sterilizing is killing all present pathogens or bacteria. We sterilize things before we get ready for surgery. We sanitize things when we want them to be super clean. And I hope that answers that question. So another question that we often get is what is pectin? Uh, you know, we can buy the, the commercial pectins. It comes as a powder and it comes as a liquid. And by the way, those two are not interchangeable. Again, and I know you're tired of hearing me say this, but follow the recipe exactly. If it calls for liquid pectin, get liquid pectin. So anyway, where does pectin come from? Well, it comes actually from, from the fruits that we would uh, also use to make our jams and jellies. It is higher and naturally occurring in some types of fruits, and, and those are listed there on the slide, apples, gooseberries, plums, grapes, and then lower in, in others. As we mentioned, both in the video and then when uh, we were talking about the fruit selection, the less ripe fruit has more natural pectin in it. And so then that's why we often say if you're making a recipe without the use of commercial pectin, you would want to make sure that one quarter to even up as much as one third of your fruit to be under ripe. And it's the pectin combined with the acid in, in the fruit and temperature that causes the gelling process to occur. So it's really important in the whole process and we want to make sure we're using the right kind and the right amount. Another very, very common question is, how can I reduce the sugar in my sweet spreads? There's a lot of sugar in jams and jellies and conserves and, and all of the, the spreads that we talked about. And, and we use sugar for a couple of different reasons. One is that it makes it taste good. But secondly, sugar binds with the water in the fruit and actually aids in the preservation process. If you do want to use less sugar, then we recommend you buy the commercial pectin that is made for a low sugar spread. And so uh, quite often they're a different color, they'll have a different label on them. It'll be very clear to you that this is specifically for a low sugar recipe. Uh, there are no substitutions, uh, but you can find some recipes both on USDA and the National Center for Home Food Preservation that have been designed to use less sugar or, or to use an alternative sweetener. Um, you must follow again those recipes exactly. Don't take a regular recipe and swap out uh, an artificial sweetener for it. Uh, one, you won't be satisfied with the consistency of the product and again when I said that sugar binds with water and uh, has something to do with um, spoilage, we do find that the reduced sugar products tend to spoil a little more quickly and you'll want to pay particular attention to them. But it can be done, you just need to follow the, the recipe exactly. Again, oh no, what happened? My spread was too stiff. It has sugar crystals. Oh, and it molded. So, so although making jam and jelly 
is a relatively easy process, there are things that can go wrong. So if it's too stiff, maybe you overcooked it. Uh, your temperature was too high. Uh, sugar crystals, maybe you did not uh, stir the, the sides of the pan and so some sugar was allowed to crystallize on the edge of the pan. Uh, sometimes people go ahead and, and let that happen and then before they put the product in jars, they'll take a, a wet paper towel very carefully because it's hot and wipe those sugar crystals out. You might also see some naturally occurring tartate uh, crystals if you're uh, using grape and that's just a naturally occurring um, product of, of the grape itself and there are some things you can do to avoid that and again uh, if, it, if it molded or, or has a fermenty smell or, or otherwise seems off well you know something happened maybe in the processing um, uh, you know any number of things could happen but what we don't want you to do is just to simply scrape that mold off and go ahead and use it if mold is present please throw it out now how do i reduce soft jelly and like i said earlier uh you might want to wait before you take this next step sometimes jam or jelly can take up to two weeks to really uh, set and so let those jars sit undisturbed if you do need to move them to a cabinet that's fine but don't be jostling them around too much wait a couple of weeks if it's still soft well then you can you can reprocess redo it and we have the instructions uh, in one of our handouts to do that and uh, it, it can be done and also um, you know, if, if you don't want to go to that trouble, and as I said earlier, you can call it then, this is a, oh, oh I made um, a, a honey, I made a fruit honey, or uh, you made strawberry topping or um, something similar for ice cream. Don't be too hard on yourself, it's still going to be delicious. The resources that we recommend are the National Center for Home Food Preservation, as well as our own Illinois Extension Food Preservation site. There are wonderful uh, directions on both of these sites, and you should be able to follow step by step. The Illinois one has several other videos. We shared with you the strawberry jam uh, video uh, this afternoon, but there are other videos on there as well. So, questions. Lisa, what yes. can I, how can I help? <laughs> I see we have 99 yes. messages. <laughs> yes, thank no. you all for, thank you all for hanging in there. Thank you all for <laughs> typing in the chat box. So, what do we need to talk about now? Okay, the first thing I do want to get into before I start handing you a few questions here is we did get quite a few questions about the handouts. So, okay. yes. We are going to be sending out the handouts. Um, they are going to be coming within the next week or so. Um, we are working right now. I know there was questions about our previous webinars and our handouts, and we're talking about moving them potentially to our website, and we will make sure to let people know when they are put on there as well, because they want handouts, and we just haven't, we haven't been able to upload everything just yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first thing I want, for Mary Liz, I've got a good question for you that I know we get asked a lot with extension. So can you use a steam canning setting on an Instant Pot or is that considered unsafe even though it's marketed to be able to do so? Excellent question. I am so glad this question was asked because although the manufacturer uh, indicates that it is a, a safe process, the uh, Center for Home Food Preservation has not yet determined that to be a safe way to preserve food. So, so short answer, no. Uh, it's best to just go with the old fashioned method. There are some commercial electric countertop canners mm -hmm. that are different from your uh, electric pressure cooker. So made specifically for canning, uh, they will process, I don't know, I think like three or four small half pints or pints at a time. And those, are okay to use but the other that the, those multi-function uh, appliances no all righty so that's one of them um another one and this is a great question that comes in a lot is i just purchased a new pressure canner do i need to have the gauge tested if it has never been used if it's never been used it was calibrated in the factory now if 
you've had it setting in, oh, I don't know, your unheated garage or, or a very damp basement or, or you know, some, somewhere like that, you might want to run in and, and have it tested, but, but those are calibrated at the factory and should be good to go. All right. This is, we have plenty of time here. Here's another good question is why remove the foam? In your video, you showed you remove the foam. What right, foam? right. And that's just for aesthetic reasons. You know, in my house, I don't remove the foam because my children like the foam. Uh, so it, it has nothing to do, it, it, it tastes good, uh, nothing to do with food safety. It's just, uh, it makes a prettier jar if you remove it. Good question. All righty. Okay. So this one's more of a situational question. So I put okay. several jars in the fridge once cooled to try to help them set more quickly. They're still sealed. Is it safe to pull them out and put them on a shelf or will that affect the seal? It shouldn't. Um, actually, next time, let's just leave them on the counter. Uh, you know, anytime you're changing uh, temperatures, um, you're gonna, the, you're gonna have condensation on the jar and, and it's not gonna affect the seal, but it could theoretically if you don't wipe off the lid it could lead to rust in the lid which could impair the seal itself um, so again short answer no you should be fine just wipe off that condensation and next time just just leave them set on your counter sure okay i'm looking back here so does the rack holding the jars in the pot need to be a certain distance from the bottom or is there a height as long as the water flows all around. As long as the water flows all around, the, the purpose of the rack is so that the jars are not resting directly on the bottom of the pan and uh, with the boiling water causing them to rock back and forth with the bubbles coming up underneath them. So um, yeah, as long as there's action all around them, you're good. All right, do you have a suggestion as a reasonable alternative if you have a smooth top electric stove? Oh, yeah, that's, that is so hard. And you know, I have a smooth top electric stove. And when I bought it, I wish I would have known that you couldn't can on it. Um, yeah, suggestion I, is to I have it too, Mary Liz, I have yeah. a ceramic. They yeah. do sell some canners that are specifically for the flat top stove, but I've been really hesitant to use it. Yeah. Um, and I, so I yeah. did find it. I'll just add in real quick. Uh -huh. Ball sells an electric um, water bath canner, which I love, and it plugs in and it's got a spigot so you can put it right by your sink and fill it. And then when you're done um, processing and the water has cooled, you can just open up that spigot and the water goes right into the sink. So oh, wow. I'll just yeah. mention that. I love that. Yes, I think I have seen those and that is a good idea. Um, I, I have done water bath canning on my smooth top stove. I will not use my pressure canner on it though, um, particularly because of the weight. But you can, um, yeah, I also have an old electric stove in my basement that has the coils that I, that I use on occasion. Or you can, if, if, I think they have like some commercial, um, not commercial, but like home use, um, what am I want to say? Like a hot plate with a with a coil on it. Um, that you can use that as long as it's going to get hot enough. I'm just not real familiar with that. And you can also use um, a propane ring, but you have to be very very careful that the that heat source is not so hot that it's going to damage your pan. Um, you know, you're just wanting to maintain that rolling boil and and not get up above that. If that makes sense. Here's another I hope I answer your question. question. Yeah. Okay. Is it is the top half, so if the top half inch or so of a light colored jam, like a peach, darkens over time, is it unsafe to eat? No, that's just part of what peaches do. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of like tomatoes might do that as well. Uh, worst case scenario, that might be an indication that you didn't exhaust all the air out in the canning process. Um, but as long as you did the follow the directions exactly you should be okay with that um, peaches are just a delicate delicate fruit oh here's another good one so and this is how do you keep your rings from rusting so even when i dry, dry them usually it seems like many of them end up with rust on them when i pull them out yeah do you store them in your basement maybe 
Um, but yeah, try and store them as dry as possible. You can also like crinkle up a newspaper to put in the box with them or layer them. I know this sounds like it's very labor intensive, but you could, you could put layers of paper towel in between and that might help as well. Just the, the key is to keep them as dry as possible. Alrighty, let's see. I'm trying to still go back here. Um, this one's come up a few times and I think you did address it, I can't remember, but after they've been processed and sealed, how long can we keep them? Oh, yes, good question. <laughs> um, they're best used within a year. Theoretically, a sealed uh, jar of food will last several years, but again, you've gone to all the trouble and expense to make this wonderful product. Let's eat it within a year when it is at its best quality. Okay, let's see. So I'm going back here. I want to make sure I'm addressing as many as I can. Like mm -hmm. I said, all of these questions as we're going in, we are going to copy them all and give you a nice handout with all the answers as well. So if we've missed them or if I haven't personally sent you a private message with an answer, we are going to answer them as well. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great one. Somebody said they use silicone mitts to hold the jars when they're filling them. So oh, that that's a good hard. idea because they are very hot. Good yep. idea. Yep. Let's see. So we have a master gardener. Um, we talked about an alternative. Let's see. Is there any other questions? Once the jars are cool, just double checking my list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's one. Okay. We also have people using propane staves as camping soap to do boiling water bath outside their home. That seems unsafe to me. So any suggestions on camping propane stoves for canning outside? Right, I'm, I'm not familiar with camping propane stoves. I know they, people use them when they camp. And, and I would say if you, you know, are, are an experienced camper or an experienced user of that, um, you, you could use it. I, I do know, uh, I used to work with, with someone who used something similar to that with the little canisters of propane when she did food demos and she got along just fine with that but again it's that constant source of heat you don't want to run out of, of gas or propane midstream so so you just want to make sure you have all those um, factors covered before you attempt anything like that and again uh, depending on fumes and that sort of thing I know the the uh, apparatus that my colleague used um, didn't need to be vented um, and so that that might be slightly different but but um, all those safety factors need to be taken into play you know if you've got open flame um, the the gas um, that that byproduct and that sort of thing so you want to you want to do your homework there um, and that's not something that I don't that I know very much about sure Okay, um, this one came up here asking about, talking about water bath canning, can I just use a large pot? <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. As long as you've got a rack on the bottom and one to two inches of water above the jar and then an, an additional one to two inches for uh, the action of the boiling water. But yes, yes, you can. Yeah. All righty, let's see. Okay. This one, if you overfill your jar, is there an easy way to remove product or just a spoon? Just wondering because of sterilization. Mm -hmm. Just use a clean spoon, you're good. And then rewipe that top, but yeah. Yeah, sometimes a funnel, uh, you, can, you can overfill fairly easily. You think, oh, just one more spoon and then oops, you have too much. Yeah, just, just spoon it out and, and put it back in your, in your uh, pan. Okay. So electric stoves tend to go on and off also. Do you not use that either when you can? Um, that's interesting. The, the old fashioned electric coil stove should stay on. Yeah. Okay, a lot of these that we've addressed. And we will, I know there's been a couple of questions in here as well regarding our web, wanting to sign up for our other ones. And I'm so sorry you guys didn't hear about a lot of our previous webinars. I will put in the link here for registering for the other ones as well. And then the follow-up email with the handouts will also have a link for registering if you miss some of our other webinars and you still like to sign up. We're still happy to take more people in these classes. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, you know, uh, the ones that you missed, they're going to be posted so you can uh, watch them at your leisure. Here's some other good ones here. We got a couple more questions coming in. We got mm -hmm. so little time. Can you use okay. banana or papayas to do jams? No. I like to do tropical fruit. That's what they said in there. Okay. Um, no, I, I don't believe so. And that's, that's an excellent question. And I would have to do some research on that. But off the top of my head, 
um, because those remind me of pumpkin and there is no safe home processing for a, a pumpkin butter, uh, for example. And uh, both banana and papaya make me think of that. And that's just my kind of um, experience talking. That's, that's not sound answer, but what we can do is we can jot that down. Lisa, we've got that written down and we can, we can do a little research on that. Sure, and this is another one that we may have to do some research, but I'll see if you know it off the top of your head, is are currants high in pectin? Or is there a difference between a red and a black currant? Oh, I don't know. Oh, my I don't know. know. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question here is, is the set of jam affected by a low sugar recipe? I know me and you had talked about those diabetes mm -hmm. friendly recipes. Right. It, it can be. I mean, you might not end up with a texture you're, that uh, you're familiar with. But, uh, but again, if you follow the recipe exactly, you're, you're going to have a, a product that, um, although not identical to the full sugar, it, it will be acceptable. Okay. And I don't know if I addressed this one or not, but I see it's come up a couple times. Is the raspberry jam, I opened kettle processed. It did not, and did not hot water process. Um, it has sealed and it did seal well. Do I still water process? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, here's a good one to bring up. This is something that was just addressed not too long ago with extension. I heard elderberry jam and jellies. Mm -hmm. We need to now be careful because of the pH of elderberries. With just seeing your thoughts on that. Right. And what we have heard from the USDA is that they, meaning the governmental testing site has not determined a safe processing point for the elderberry products. And what they're recommending is that you go ahead and, and make the recipes and then freeze it. Okay. And if somebody's got a question, kind of what we addressed in the beginning, but how do you get your cans hot in the beginning? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. That, then you can use your sanitized setting in your uh, dishwasher. Or what I like to do is just keep them in that simmering water of the boiling water bath and then just pull them out one at a time. Yeah. All righty. Well, I'm seeing if I missed any. Oh, somebody asked if you could use vegan margarine. I think margarine is vegan. So yeah. <laughs> Margarine's made from vegetable oil, so you should be good to go. Mm -hmm. I'm making sure I got as many as I could here. But one thing that I don't think that I mentioned when we were talking about um, fruit and the condition of fruit and then and then, then the gelling, the subsequent gelling, uh, what we have noticed is on very wet years, and this is particularly with strawberries, very wet years, uh, we have a little more difficulty getting the, the strawberry jams and jellies to sit because the fruit itself has more water in it. So there's no solution to that. But if you have a jam or jelly that doesn't set and you just think back, okay, was it a super, did I pick them after, you know, a three inch rain or something? All righty, I think we've got tried to hit as many as I possibly could on these. Okay. But again, if I missed any of them, I promise we'll get them all in a really nice um, handout for you so you can get all the answers in case maybe you had to jump off. Absolutely. Or you yes. But, and yeah. this is recorded as well. So, oh, any recipes by volume or weight? Or recipes oh. by volume or weight, sorry. <laughs> um, you can find them either way. Either way. As long as you get them from a reliable source. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, um, exactly. Here we go. If we'll do this last one here. Okay. If you can, if you have canned using an instant pot for a batch, what can you do with those products at this point? Freeze them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of research out there about these electric pressure cookers. There is. And, and unfortunately, and I believe Lisa, yeah. weren't, didn't you do a little research and the yeah. manufacturers are still maintaining that they are right and the USDA is saying, no, you're not. And so yeah. uh, there's kind of a conflict there. Yeah, yeah. Utah did a huge study on all these different types of electric pressure cookers and they're still proving that they're not safe over time, so. Okay, good yeah. to know. Yeah. All righty, guys. All right. Okay, oh. Lisa. Yeah, kind of wrapping things up nice and neatly here. I did want to briefly mention we have in our previous webinars this extending wellness texting program. It's again completely free. What happens is you're going to receive two text messages a week with some healthy eating, finances, family issues, as well as other information about what's going on from campus. Um, we don't share your phone number. You can opt out anytime. 
And you can always sign up through go.illinois.edu backslash wellness tips. And I'll also put that in the chat box as well. Like I said, if you want to register for other webinars, we are going to be sending an email out with that link as well. And just a quick reminder, we are going to be sending, and you should have already received an email with our survey. We do ask that you fill it out. It helps us improve things within our webinars, as well as suggestions and what you'd like to see in the future. This is also be your instruction for how to get the handouts. So it is important that you fill the, out the survey for us. Um, but again, this webinar is recorded and you can always get, have access to these at go.illinois.edu backslash nutrition well. And join Mary Liz and I next week <laughs> as we talk about pickling. It'll be us two again and me monitoring that chat box and answering, helping answer questions. So same time, same place, same type of format. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, we have additional resources and those will be included in our, in our uh, thank you email along with the survey. And again, always uh, feel free to contact your local extension office if you have any questions about uh, nutrition, wellness, food preservation, food safety, uh, anything along those lines. We are happy to help. That's what we're here for. And we hope that you all have a great rest of your day, a wonderful weekend, and we hope to see you next Wednesday for All About Pickle.